Okay, uh, good day, people. Um, I would like to talk um, about Docker, the use of Docker for Perl people. Uh, some people, some people know me as uh, LJ of NXADM on IRC on Twitter or whatever. I'm also the dev room manager. We have kind of a schedule problem last time, so that's uh, last minute, so that's why I'm here. Um, a, a, a little about me. I work at the information, uh, the Com Competence Center for Information Security at the University of Leuven, and we do uh, stuff related to security, to um, identity, to authentication, authorization, and stuff like that. Um, so I would like to start with um, with a kind of controversial question. So what kind of problem does Docker solve for Perl? <laughs> and uh, a typical reaction would be. What problem? Do we have a problem? And it's true that in Perl, like we we had CPAN for like ages, you know, before the people with beer beer were born. Um, we have a very nice testing culture. Um, we have a very nice community. We are very, we're great at writing tools. So it's very easy to to be close in your in your Perl environment because it's very nice. But if we rephrase the the question a little different, differently. Uh, we may get another answer. So if we, if we ask the question, how do we deploy our programs now in 2017, we get a lot of different answers. You know, there's more than one way to do it. Some people use CPAN or Ceph in a remote machine. I hope no one here works like that, but I've, everywhere I've worked, I've seen people doing that on production machines. Some people use uh, Rakudo Brew or Perl Brew to uh, use their own Perl um, and not use System Perl. Some people use Carton to pin the dependencies. Some people use Localib. Uh, Fatpacker, very nice if your application is uh, uh, Perl only, so you can uh, just make a, a one file, so you don't need to have this dependency tree. Uh, mini CPAN, dark CPAN. Some people just create an archive and put it on the server. Some more sysadmin type people will create an, an OS dependent package, like a Debian package of an RPM. The same kind of people will probably use a configuration management tool like Puppet, like Salt, like Rix, like Sparrow Do. And, and if we are honest with ourselves, we, 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 we must acknowledge that it can be a little fragile at times. When, when you're in full control of your environment, there are very nice tools. But when you're in kind of a bigger environment uh, where it's a separation of, of uh, responsibility, we have some people like the Linux admins uh, being responsible for the OS and updates, and you have uh, application people being responsible for the application, maybe they will do an update and your application is not uh, well tested and it will break. Um, if you are working on the cloud when you need a really fast switch uh, of environment, it compiling stuff will take a long time, so it's not always the best solution. So if we, if we look of, uh, at other examples, we, if we look over the fence uh, into other communities that kind of work around this problem, we see that it's not that easy. If we take Java by example, uh, Java is great in this regard because in Java you put everything in a jar, you put the jar in the machine, you feed it to the JVM and it runs. It will load probably, I don't know, 50,000 classes without exaggeration, but it will run, it's great. But even then, you, you will meet class path hell when you have uh, the same library with two versions on, on different path. Your application will run, but it will explode along the way. So even then, if you go to Go, also a very nice language, when you uh, do a static compilation of your program, when you add all the dependencies to your binary, you take the small file, you put it on the server, you run it, it's fantastic, it's fast, there's no VM. But even then, if you have a security problem in one of your libraries, you need to track down all those small binaries everywhere, and that's not easy if you don't have the infrastructure for it, because uh, programs tend to I'd leave the programmer. I've heard from some coll colleagues where I worked like 10 years ago, they're still using a proof of concept I wrote, and the program starts from this is a proof of concept in capital, they still use it. I don't think they even have the source, so that's, so that's a little uh, difficult. So if we look at a great example of other communities like Java and Go, we realize that deploying is always half of the question. And the real question in my eyes is how do we integrate with an ecosystem that is no longer language centric? And, and, and what do I mean by that? I mean that the future is API centric. So you don't care that much about the language, you care about the API, you care about integrating stuff together. Um, and even more, 
I could say that the present already is. If you're working with uh, with uh, within a DevOps teams, when you have a lot of people from a different backgrounds, you have uh, uh, operation people, sysadmin people that they have their own tooling. You have uh, developers that maybe have their own tooling, and. If you, if you work with people of different backgrounds, that means different languages, different frameworks, so you're already mixing stuff there. Uh, if you work with a cloud, when you, it's very important to be able to switch from one cloud provider to the other, when it's very important to be able to, to bring uh, your instances up, it's very important that you have the best tool for the job. And this is a good thing, because um, it's very possible nowadays that the, the, the best tool for the job is not written in Perl. It could be written in Java, in Go, in Ruby, it doesn't matter. Because you still get the best tool for the job. So you can integrate stuff together. Um, well, back to Docker. A typical question is, is it here to stay? Is it a hype? Because if you've been around for some years in IT, you know things come, things go, things come back slightly different. So that's a very good question. And the same people that would say, we had CPAN for like 20 years, they would say, yeah, but we already have VM. What's new? So a VM, a virtual machine, the idea behind it is to fully integrate a discrete environment, to fully to, uh, to have a full operating system. That also means that you need to fully administer an operating system. Like you used to have one big physical machine, and now you have one physical machine with 10 VMs. You need a lot more work to keep that up to date, to keep it secure, to create users, and so on. And more imp most importantly, a VM and a container are not at odds. They can work together. It's a very valid scenario to have a VM and to run containers on that. Maybe because you, you standardize around a VM, you can deploy them and, and provision them very quickly. Or maybe because of security, you don't want your containers to share the same kernel. There are a lot of valid reasons to do that. Well, after this introduction, uh, I would like to answer the question, what is Docker? Because I'm talking about Docker, 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 but I haven't explained it yet. So if I'm forced to summarize it in one word, it's, I said it already, it's a container. And the same people that said, yeah, CPAN, yeah, VM, they would say container. We have been doing that forever. My, me, myself, I've been doing that 2005 on Solaris, Solaris zones. I have probably migrated hundreds of, of physical machines to Solaris zones. It was fun, you had CC device, you could copy your, your container with, through SSH for another machine. It, it was a lot of fun. People working on, on IX probably 10 years before that. But it's not the same thing. So what's different, again, is the API. So Docker gives you an API to integrate it with other stuff. So if we redefine what a container is nowadays, of course, it's an application. It's self-contained. That's kind of the definition of a container. But the most important part is it's portable. So you work at your, at your workstation on the same container, on the same binaries as on the production server, as uh, the same thing that the customer has. So it's portable. You move stuff around and you move the same thing. You, do, you don't need to recreate everything and then test for the differences. So um, container, because of this, have a, a really huge impact on how we develop, how we distribute, and how we run software. So as a developer, it's really it's priceless to, to be able to uh, develop on the same environment as the production machine because that's it's always uh, the battle between sysadmins and developers. Yeah, it, it runs on my, on my laptop. It doesn't run on the on the on the production server. If it's too slow, whatever. So you you will develop differently because you can have the full stack, all the different services on your laptop. You can distribute it within your company. Test quality production. You just move the same thing on a new environment, you can, you can push it to a client, exactly the same thing as you're having on your laptop. And it's also a very standard way to run software. You don't care if they use SUSE, of Fedora, of Debian, of Ubuntu, you just don't care. Maybe they run, they run it on their big iron uh, in the premises. Maybe they use a cheap uh, cloud provider. You just don't care. So it's, it's a standard way to do it. So this is a visualization of how a container looks like. It took me a while to get this because it's kind of confusing what a container really is. And the most important part is the image. And an image, you can, it can be compared to an ISO, a DVD, a live Linux distribution, where you put all your libraries, all your, all your uh, um, binaries, and when you bring that up, you always get a fresh environment. Every ch change you make will be lost when you restart your container. So it's kind of 
uh, a read-only uh, environment that you can change on the fly. When you restart it, you lose it. That's the idea. You always start from a fresh environment. Then you need to have some runtime information, so something that you need to have a useful container. Maybe it, 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 it needs some network uh, addresses, some ports. Maybe it needs some access to, enough, to a file system, mount points, etc. environments, whatever. And, and, and most important for your application is the persistent data. That's uh, something you don't put in the image because the image you just you, you can put it on the internet. You don't care. But your uh, your configuration, your secrets, uh, your business data that's outside of the container, and the container has access to that. So that's those are the big three parts. And then if we look at at, at, at this again, we realize that we still need tools to manage the runtime info, the configuration, the image creation, and there are probably tools that we already talk about. And in this case, even CPAN on the server, because you're working locally, it's OK. Um, and, and Docker image file is just a series of, of scripts, of commands that you run after a basic uh, image of an operating system. You start with a very small down Debian or something, and then you say, uh, add this, add that, run that. That's it. But because you only do it once, and it's get stored in, in a kind of a binary format. It's very easy to, to have something very simple. You don't need to complicate stuff at that level. So everything is containerized. It's, everything is easy to understand. And because of that, it's also easy to implement. But if we go here, we used to have a very um, big radiator, a Perl application, uh, a radio server project, when we only use uh, Puppet. And Puppet was, the code was very complicated, very big. We had a lot of tests because Puppet had to manage users, had to manage uh, packages, services, the order they run, and, and, and at the end, it configured my application. Now with a container, I just don't do that anymore because that's, that's in an image, that's frozen. The only thing I have to do, I have to care about my, my application. So Puppet now just take files, you put it in a directory, take a template, inject some secret, and that's it. So my code is very easy to read, very easy to understand, because I don't have to look at the full picture. I only have to look at my application. So we did already that. So what does Docker bring to the table? Kind of a summary of what I said is efficient, because there's only one process running. It's running on the kernel. So the kernel uh, uh, Marion talked about, it has some C group to give you some basic security. But it's on the same kernel. It's not, it's not about emulation. Also, the way of working is very efficient because you are working on the real thing. So you save a lot of time. You don't go back and forth with, uh, with the, the sysadmins talking about what's different. It's portable. Like I said, you can distribute your, your images. And it's also embeddable. I cannot read that, so I will say embeddable. Um, that means that you, as, as, as a Perl guy of, of girl, you can create a, a base Perl image, have a very up-to-date Perl, a very secure Perl. You can provide a base set of, of images, uh, of modules, excuse me, um, that you vetted the version, you tested them, and then someone can, can take your image in your company or someone from the internet and just care about their application. They just add a layer on your image, they create a new image for their application. So you're responsible for the Perl part, and they are only responsible for the application. So it's, it's very easy to have a secure baseline that you can update, and they don't need the, all the knowledge for that. So I only have five minutes, so I will warn you. So I don't want to sell you stuff. I don't want to be only positive. So I know, do you know the first rule about Docker? I know, I know someone here. So you won't shut up about Docker. So uh, it's, it's OK to give a presentation, but don't do it at the dinner table, because <laughs> you get very annoying. I've been there, so don't do that. So more seriously, when you use Docker, you need to test. Test, test. It's not as straightforward as it looks. Yes, things are easier, things are simpler, but a lot of corner cases. You need to ask yourself some very good questions, that you, something that you always need to do, but now you're forced to do it. You need to uh, ask yourself, is my application uh, horizontally scalable? If the answer is no, you need to re-architecture your, your application, or you just don't bother with Docker, because Docker, um, uses the concept of cattle. They do, it, it, Docker doesn't care about your service, doesn't care about your, your container. If you have a resource problem, you just pop up some new one. So it's, if your application is, 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 is bound by CPU of memory, maybe that's not a good solution. Um, is your application performance in Docker? 
I already said it's very efficient, but there are some trade-offs on the level of networking, on the level of, of uh, disk I.O. Um, and because if your application is horizontally scalable, it's not that important, but still you need to test, you need to make sure that you make the right choices. Because uh, on network, there, there are some uh, implications on security, on, on flexibility, so there are choices that you need to, to make, and you make sure that you make these choices, and you, you just don't use the default of your distribution, because they, it's just a very generic setup. This is the most important thing I would say today. Docker is not a security solution. For most people that work with Docker, they think there is. It gives you a very um, dangerous, false sense of security because you think it's containerized, I'm safe, you're not. You need to follow uh, best practices, you need to follow common sense, you need to test, you need to make your application update. Of course, it's an extra layer of indirection, that's a good thing, but it's not enough. So if you get into Docker, most books, most, most talks don't go into that, you need to look into that. I don't have the time to go in detail, but with a very base minimum effort, you can get a very secure application, but you need to really be proactive about that. This is also about people, about politics. Uh, this is not a technical issue, but most companies, uh, institutions are kind of divided, operations and, and, and developers. And if you start with Docker, you get a lot of people that will have something to say about your image. You have a lot of chefs in the kitchen, so you need to be ready for that. Too. You need to have a good collaboration with other teams. You need to be able to, to, to acknowledge input, to talk about it. Um, and this also gives an opportunity, I already talked about a base Perl image. It's a very, um, very good opportunity for a, for a Perl person to, to create a standard, to, make, to be the one that is knowledge, not knowledgeable about Perl, someone that can create a baseline, someone that, that can make sure that the security is followed, and so on. Um, I have some slides left, but I'm just going to leave it at that, so maybe if there are some questions, I don't know, I can... So. Yeah, go ahead. Can you suggest to use Docker on the developer machine? Sorry? Uh, can you suggest to use Docker on the developer machine? Yeah, certainly. I will. Uh, the, the idea behind it is to to have the real thing on your on your on your laptop, so you are working on the real thing that will run on production. So I couldn't develop otherwise because otherwise you will always have uh, trouble with discussion. With it works on my laptop, it doesn't work on production. One minute, so. Okay. Can you compare so, the Docker to other container? Uh, uh, not in one minute. Okay. So I, I would say Docker is easy because there's a lot of integration already. So it, that make it easy, but uh, there are other good alternatives as well. So it's, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it like that. Uh, thank you very much.